good morning, everybody. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, I'm welcoming you to a session that will be taking place now in the next hour and a half. Uh, my name is Alan Grieco, and I will be chairing the session on cookery or medicine, question mark, uh, which is the first of two panels that are dedicated to this uh, subject. Uh, the second one will be tomorrow, as you probably have seen in your programs. Uh, this topic has been uh, touched upon very often during this conference, uh, as you will know if you've been following it. Uh, but now, today, uh, it's being broached in a very direct manner, uh, so cookery or medicine. Uh, the questions, excuse me, excuse me. The um, questions will be fielded by Virginie Hulet, uh, both in French and in, in, in English. She will translate uh, when necessary from one language back to the other. So um, thank you, Virginie, for your, your help this morning. You're welcome. So for the Q&A, you have a button below your screen. Uh, don't hesitate to ask a question during the, the talk, and I come back with the question after. Bon, pour la conférence de Madeleine Ferrier, elle aura lieu en français, donc vous pouvez poser des questions en français ou en anglais. Je m'occuperai de, de la translation, de la trans traduction. Et pour poser les questions, vous pouvez aller sur le bouton questions et réponses, Q et R point, qui est en bas de votre écran. Et durant la présentation, posez les questions, comme ça je peux les avoir directement et les poser pour vous à la fin de la présentation. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Yes, I'd like to remind everybody that, uh, of course, the session is being recorded. Donc, uh, je le dis en français aussi, uh, de vous rappeler que la session est en train d'être enregistrée et que d'ailleurs, elle va être uh, mise en ligne uh, dans 24 heures. Donc, vous pourrez la revoir. Uh, I say that in English. Uh, the session will be available uh, as of uh, tomorrow and so you can uh, go back to check if there's anything that you missed in uh, the present uh, presentation so uh, our first speaker this morning is going to be vanessa asfora nadle it's a great pleasure to be welcoming you She's an historian working on medieval food history uh, and the history of medicine. Currently, she's a research collaborator for the Diaita Heritage Project at the Center for Classical and Humanistic Studies at the University of Coimbra in uh, Portugal. And she's also a coordinator of the LATIM at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Vanessa? Take it away. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. In ancient and medieval texts, the recipe understood as a brief form that presents a succession of ingredients and procedures to be followed, as proposed by Bruno Lohue in 1997, is often placed at the crossroads of dietetics, pharmacology, and cooking. By observing, for example, how the doctor prescribes the use of a particular recipe, in dietetics therapy, it's possible to raise questions about the circumscriptions of the dietary and the culinary knowledge and how they are put into practice in specific historical settings. I intend to approach issues like this using Marsilio Ficino's Concilio contro la Pestilencia as my main source and to get closer to the context of the second plague pandemic. This is a new research recently started, so this communication will be the very first opportunity to share with you a work in progress. I have set three main objectives for the uh, research as a whole. First, to verify the role played by food in the therapy against the plague. Second, 
to analyze food preparation procedures in the recipes in order to individuate the existence of a possible culinary component. And third, to deepen the reflection on the relationship between theory and practice related to food, crossing data in the Consiglio contro la pestilenza and other 15 and early 16th Italian uh, century Italian textual and iconographical sources directly or indirectly related to the plague. Today I will focus on just a few ideas related to the objectives number one and two. The Consiglio contro la pestilenza was written by Marsilio Ficino, one of the most famous humanists and physicians of the second half of the 15th century in Italy. He wrote in the context of a new outbreak of the second plague pandemic that ravaged Florence again in the years 1478 and 1470-80. The work is thus born with a strong practical character. Although one can identify information coming from a more theoretical background in its argumentation, particularly when Ficino dialogues with his ancient and medieval medical and philosophical sources. The Concilio was written in the Tuscan language, which evidences Ficino's intention to reach both the professional doctor and the common reader. The dissemination of Ficino's ideas presented in the Concilio was boosted by the circulation of the first printed editions and the rise of new studies on plague diseases on the 16th century. The work was published for the first time in Florence in 1481, and seven new reprints were printed in the 16th century. Since then, the Concilio became a reference, <coughs> excuse me, much corroborated <coughs> or discussed by the 16th century physicians. The text is organized into a small prologue and 23 chapters dealing essentially with the definition of the plague, its characteristics, signs, and therapy. Advice against the pestilence is roughly part of a wider genre of medical literature called concilia. The medical concilium is usually a tripartite text in which the first part is dedicated to identifying the patient's case and the second and the third parts to the appropriate therapy to cure the disease in question. The concilia against the plague are usually slightly different in form because they tend to focus on cure and therapy. <clears throat> uh, the need to find effective solutions in the fight against the disease, which in the 15th century remained a deadly threat, forced doctors to rethink and rework urgently and attentively the current medical theories, many of which had already proved to be ineffective in order to formulate and prescribe adequate recommendations to the patients. Ficina's knowledge of pestilentia, the disease caused by, by the bacteria Yersinia pestis, is essentially that one shared by his contemporaries and even by his predecessors, such as Hippocrates, Galen, Avicenna, and Gentile da Foligno. That is to say, he believes pestilentia was a type of plague, like those described in ancient medical literature, but with exceptional virulence. The pestilentia is born of the air. It's a specific kind of poison, a poisonous vapor, harmful to the vital spirit. When a woman or a man is contaminated by the plague, inside the body, a battle between the disease and the vital spirits takes place. This battle gives life to the body and accordingly to the Ficinian conception, also to the soul. Curiously, the vital spirit is also a type of vapor generated by the most subtle part of the blood in the heart. The constitution of the two vapors are practically opposite in the proportion of their qualities, coldness, heat, dryness, and humidity. For this reason, the strategies put into action to combat the plague found in the text are usually strategies for managing the contact of the human bodies with those four qualities in a positive way. In the context, in the context of the plague, more than ever, bodies should be taken care of so as not to weaken and open themselves up to illnesses. 
The health of the body was basically maintained through the precepts of the ancient Diaita, rules of life, grounded in the ancient and medieval medical tradition. Among these precepts, to avoid excess, to keep the body closed or protect, and to stay away from heat and humidity are the dominant advices in the text. <coughs> to reflect on culinary knowledge, I will focus almost exclusively on the recommendations found in chapter five on diet or como si conserva dalla peste per regola di vita. If we take into account the usual definition for recipe, as for example, the definition proposed by Bruno Lohiu mentioned before, we can count only one recipe in chapter five, five with its variation. The great majority of recipes in stricto sensu is found in chapters devoted exclusively to the care of the sick, like chapter six, como si conserve dalla peste per modo medicinale, chapter seven, de, de la cura secondo la fisica, and chapter eight, del cibare e governo dello infermo. In these cases, we have lists of ingredients with or without precise measurement indications, uh, the list of ingredients necessary to prepare medicinal composites, of which the teriaca, the famous anti-poison remedy of antiquity, was undoubtedly the most efficient one. This was indeed to be expected in a text whose primary nature is undoubtedly medical. Our proposal, however, is to try to read between the lines, if I may say so, in search of what I believe exists in this kind of medical writing, even if we do not find the canonical formal structure of, of a text recipe. In other words, I believe something of the culinary um, knowledge of the time might be presented in a more fluid text that proposes or recommends the use of a certain type of culinary procedures in order to transform the qualitative attributes of a certain type of food or food preparation. From now on, I will be referring to this fluid text as recommendations. According to the text, heat and humidity are qualities that contribute to the opening of the body's pores, which facilitates its weakening through the escape of vital fluids, and also to the alteration of the body humors, facilitating putrefaction and the consequent deterioration of the bodies. Following this logic, Ficino's general rule is to stay away of food ingredients or preparations that are hot or humid, especially those which are excessively hot and humid. Heat and humidity in food should be avoided or at least minimized through the act of making the right food choices, of course, and to performing operations of corrections. Making the right food choices involves a knowledge or a know-how based in two aspects. Provenance, ingredients should come from arid, aromatic and high places like hills and mountains. Ingredients with these oranges should be used as abundantly as possible. And qualities, the qualities of ingredients. It is necessary here to recognize which ingredients are prevalently hot, like salt, meat, certain types of spices and herbs, strong sources or sources that are too uh, acid or citric, and certain types of wine. And also to recognize the humid, uh, humid ingredients like milk and ricotta, certain types of fish and viscous sweets, and not to use them all. In case it's really necessary to consume such ingredients, the general indication is to do it in very small quantities. Otherwise, their undesirable qualities may cause excess of blood and cholera and the consequent putrefaction and inflammation of the body. Chapter 5 presents, presents in a not very organized way um, a number of food items to be consumed, to be avoided and also to be uh, um, corrected. At the moment, I'm working the systematization of all the food items mentioned in that, in that part, in that chapter. Uh, by categories for time's sake and also because I would like to deepen this study before presenting it, the discussion of the categories and their problematics will be left for another time. Um, so let's proceed now to uh, talk a little bit about the second point related to the necessity of minimizing the negative effects 
of ingesting hot and or humid uh, food items or food preparations. When it, when it was not possible to make a proper choice, it was necessary to perform operations to correct the undesirable food qualities or to produce desirable ones. These operations are nothing more than culinary procedures. And the most effective of these culinary procedures mentioned in the text are roasting and flavoring. Roasting allows drying the food, as we know, extracting or balancing its humidity, and therefore, from the point of view of medicine, humoral medicine, making, making it a safe food for individuals that should avoid or counterbalance humidity in food. In times of plague, this principle, instead of being directed to specific groups of individuals, is aimed to the general population as the everyday diet. A roast cuisine is, right, is highly recommended. Although it's not possible to precise in the text if pan roasted or oven roasted, soups or liquids as juices, for example, appear only when it's necessary to treat those who were already sick. However, baking only is not enough. Flavoring is the fundamental culinary operation in the kitchen in times of pestilence. In Ficinus Concilio, the general recommendation is to cook or to correct food with good aromas acid and salty sauces for hot items, or sugar in the case of two wet food items. This would solve three possible problems. To prevent the potential putrefaction of ingredients that may have been exposed to the pestilential vapors in nature, to purify the bodies and also to purify the air. The preferable culinary preparations were then those that have acid or vinegary, sharp or uh, sugary flavors. I can give you uh, two examples for this. First, the Ficino recommendation, Ficino's recommendation on how to properly prepare fried fish. After being fried in oil, the fish should be put in, into liquids or sauces coming from grapes, acid grapes or vinegar or bitter orange with salt and a bit of pepper and cinnamon. Second, his recommendation to eat ricotta as a first dish with sugar added on it. It is believed that these flavors could refresh, dry, preserve and fortify the bodies. As we, as we find in other similar medical writings, the mixes of herbs and spices to counteract the food qualities can be quite specific because they depend on many things and basically on the equation qualities of the food items and the consumer's profile. But in those difficult times, Ficino seems to want to make things easier for his contemporaries and recommends a useful recipe of mixed seasonings a spezzeria to be used in all kinds of dishes. Half an ounce of red sandalwood, three and a half drama of cinnamon and half drama of saffron. This is the only recipe in the stricto sensu Ficino includes in the chapter on diet, as I mentioned before. The recipe, as we can infer, even without going deep into the analysis of the mentioned plants, assemble three important properties that a good food in times of pestilence should have, aromatic, calorific, and astringent. To conclude this part, I would like to add a few words at the important aspect of flavoring highlighted in, in, in that part of the text, the aromatizing function. It is obviously difficult to think of a cuisine that is not aromatic. Every cuisine has its particular smells. However, in the case of the cuisine that seems to emerge from Ficino's text, the common denominator in the praised aroma is their sanitizing or their cleansing powers. In agreement with the relational logic that connects the micro and the macrocosmos, a kind of logic that plays an important role in the structure of medieval thought, food that smells good and emanates good odors contributes to cleaning the bodies and the air. So now to my closing remarks. More than final remarks, what I have here are questions, very broad and complex questions, you will see it. 
even though I consider important to share them with you because they are somehow guiding my uh, guiding me through this uh, new research at this very beginning phase. First, as in, as in non-epidemic times, the role of food remains an essential part to guaranteed health. The difference, it seems, lies in a closer observance of one type of food diet with common characteristics aimed to everyone who was not sick. Perhaps the more individualized traits that characterize the food diet based on the rules of medicine are alleviated or relaxed in favor of a diet that is moderate in quantity, prevalently dry and cold, and odoriferous. Here, a question which is not particularly new should be reconsidered. To what extent this relaxation of the guiding medical precepts in food recommendations would have influenced medieval food taste and the medieval food cuisine? Two, taking into consideration the canonical definition of recipe or definitions of recipe, it has to be admitted that recipes presented in the chapter on diet of Ficinus Concilio are not an exception are an exception, sorry. The highest incidence of what I call recommendation is a, a, a more uh, proper um, uh, thing to, to consider. Even though in these recommendations, it's quite clear the proximity with the culinary domain or cuisine, if we prefer, since there are two culinary procedures that would allow adjusting the diet, the diet in times of plague, roasting and flavoring. These were culinary procedures aimed to prepare dishes that maintain or produce astringency, dryness, and um, the freshness of the body, avoiding the fearful humidity that would lead to their internal putrefaction. The question that arises from this point is, is it possible that a roasting and cleansing aromatic cuisine might have been more appreciated and sought after in times of plague? Considering that the that, that second plague pandemic was quite long and functioned as a kind of background for the social and cultural life from the mid 14th century on, we could hypothesize about its relation to the culinary options that characterize the cuisine of the late Middle Ages and the one from early modern period. In other words, is it reasonable to ask to what extent the second plague pandemic could be considered as an event of medium duché, which influenced the culinary options from the 14th century on? Or more specifically, what was the role of the second plague pandemic and the dietary recommendations stemming from it to the slow and complex process of construction of the cuisine of the late Middle Ages? I'm not trying to say medieval cuisine and even early modern cuisine was a simple derivative, a byproduct of the medicine of those times. On the contrary, I'm just thinking that perhaps we historians have not yet reflected deeply enough on how the different rhythms of the pandemic influenced the long and complex process of transformation from ancient to medieval to early modern cooking and cuisine. But as it has been proved by the presentations in this symposium, we are living a very special moment when the already non-cookbooks and recipes are being reassessed through new manuscripts and even new cookbooks and recipes are being discovered. Given this, to come back to the old chicken or egg dilemma, or egg dilemma of the influence of medicine in cuisine or vice versa makes sense to me. To my research, particularly having all these questions in the horizon, helps me to build a methodological framework where to place the comparative study I intend to make to achieve the third objective of my uh, research. It's a work in progress, as I said before, that will certainly benefit from the results of the Korama project and from any comments or critics you would like to make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa, for your being on time also, and for uh, this very concise uh, view of uh, the uh, of Marsilio Ficino's Consiglio contro la pestilenza.
uh, I think Virginie can probably has several questions for you already. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have first question from Beatrice Reno. Uh, sugar considered as a spice, is it considered as medicine? The fact that we often find the mention of sugar is recipe for passion. So is the question from uh, spy, sugar is the spy, advice of did we use all the time spy with uh, medicine? Um, thank you, Beatrice, for your question. If I uh, understood it um, clearly, um, I think you would like to know if in, in, in the case of the text, uh, the, the concilio, sugar was used as, um, uh, as a medicine or as a, as a, 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 a spicy. Um, well, I can tell you in this case, in the case of this text, is is also used to transform um, food in, in the chapter uh, related to diet, to the food recommendations for people who are not sick already. So sugar is used to transform the qualities and to make the quality of the food preparation, the dish more suitable, not to um, make the body um, more suitable, not to weaken the body, to open the body to the, the, the danger of the plague. So in this case, I would say in this specific part of the test, text, I would say sugar is used as a spicy that helps uh, to season, to temperate the food, not as a single a medicine, uh, an individual, uh, individuate uh, medicine. But in the chapters regarding to, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, medicines, because there are mainly three chapters full of recipes of medicinal compounds. Sugar appears in a different um, in a different context, like a, a, a medical ingredient, I would say, together with other uh, medicinal ingredients. I don't know if I, I answered the question. Yes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question from uh, Antoine Soulier. Uh, you show a receipt with precision racket to measure of quantity. Is it possible to find this kind of pre attention only on medical clinical book or is it specific to this book? So uh, about the measure and the quantity in your book, is it all, all the time pre uh, recipe or also cooking recipe? I'm sorry, Virginie, could you repeat the last part again? So Antoine uh, Soulier asks you if when you have the measure and quantity in your recipe, is it all the time with medical culinary book or is also with uh, other book? Ah, okay, thank you, Antoine. Um, I'm just trying to understand the last part. Is it possible to find this kind of presentation on a medical culinary book? Well, the, the use of measurement, precise measurements and, and quantities are more common in medical recipes. We, but we can find it in culinary books, well, the ones that I have more familiar familiarity with. But generally, um, the specific measurements indications are more common in medical uh, recipes. In the case of the concilio, when we are when we are working in the chapters dealing with the med the recipes for medicinal composites, we find many recipes with measurements. M maybe the majority of them include measurements, um, but when we are dealing with more um, culinary recommendations the ones that I mentioned that are more present in chapter five, we don't find uh, uh, measurements, precise means, except that one that I showed for the Spetseria. Thank you. Now I have a question from Marie Iman about the roasting. Is it pan roasting or oven roasting? Do they like specially mention oven roasting or it's only roast? only roast. Um, I need, um, thank you Mary for your question. Um, I need to, as I said before, I'm working the systematization of all the information 
uh, and, and the details in uh, regarding each food items or each food preparation. But at the moment, so far, I cannot precise if they are pan roasted or oven roasted. The texts are, are very confused sometimes. And Ficino, especially in the culinary uh, recommendations, Ficino goes on and back. And so we need really to do a detailed analysis to try to apprehend this information if we can. So I, I cannot precise this for now. Uh, no, I see that Primo, you have a question. Yes, uh, sorry. You hear me, no? Yes, we do. Yes, I don't know if you see me because I have a problem. So uh, thank you, Vanessa, for your very interesting uh, communication. Um, I, I wonder one thing, when you speak about uh, um, uh, second pandemic, second pandemic plague, it's the, 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 black, uh, the black pest, uh, simply, no? Or is yeah. it, uh, yes, so from, from the 14th century on? Exactly, I'm thinking, um, I'm trying, um, I'm trying to think, um, to contextualize the production of these texts from the Black Death on. Because uh, as the medical historians, medieval historians at the moment are, are working more in this long um, durée of the pandemics, they are considering not the Black Death as singling out this event, mm -hmm. but putting it in a more broad context. So the, 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 the worst outbreak, which was the Black Death, and this, the subsequent ones that happened in different rhythms in different parts of Europe. So trying to put this uh, text and its uh, contemporaries um, okay. uh, text in this whole context, trying to mm. see if it's possible mm. to see if there was any relation with this urge, this necessity to deal with the disease with the recommendations that use culinary procedures. So maybe you have a project, a broad project on the, on the all the, the pest tracts that, was, uh, that were produced in, in huge, huge numbers uh, from the 14th century. It would be really interesting if you could, uh, maybe not alone, but uh, if sure. you could uh, study uh, all this huge material, which, is, uh, which has not been really uh, explored, uh, studied um, in, a comprehensive, uh, in a comprehensive way. Yes, uh, Bruno, you are right, because this idea started as a very small project just to study Ficinus and, mm. and, and his more close um, uh, peers, uh, the ones that wrote uh, about the plague in, in, in central Italy. But now I'm, I'm really interested in this topic and I'm trying to build a more enlarged corpus for, for a more enlarged um, uh, duche mm -hmm. and trying to see this um, in a more systematized way. Um, uh, more or less to point this in, in, in the law, in the medium duche, as I said, in the Brudelian sense of the term. Yeah. Yes, and, um, and of course, this is huge. I don't have the, um, probably I will cut, make a lot of cuts in my original idea because the number of tracks are, as you said, enormous. But let's see if I can deal with that, at least for the, fir the, the first part of it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to interrupt you because time is, is running out. I had a question too, but it's, a, it's too late to do it. I will do it privately with you. But, Thank and you. it has to do with, you know, why did he write it in Italian rather than in Latin? Because I think that's a sort of an interesting point that, that I'm sure you could develop. But uh, unfortunately, we have to move on. And uh, so our next speaker is going to be um, Jens Ake Schnall, uh, who is Associate Professor of Old Norse Studies at the University of Bergen in uh, Norway. And he holds a DPhil in, in Scandinavian and German Studies from the University of Göttingen. 
uh, his uh, research uh, interests lie predominantly in medieval and early modern studies, and they include medieval and early modern food cultures, encyclopedic literature, literature, science and technology, mapping and cartography, learned networks, as well as medievalism and nation building in 19th and 20th century Scandinavia and Germany. Thanks for, for the kind introduction and uh, especially thanks uh, to the organizers and, and the speakers um, uh, also for not just arranging this beautiful conference, but also for having me because I am more not, not concluding a research project. I'm rather at the start, I'm going to look cl more closely into the recipe literature of medieval Scandinavia. And uh, this is a very uh, superb opportunity for me to, to connect uh, to your research that gives my own um, a significant boost. So th thanks a lot. Um, and I plunge into my paper. The doctor's diet could be read with a question mark. I deal with culinary recipes in medieval Scandinavia. And um, the funny thing is we have three recipe collections at different times. One from around 1300, a Danish one um, um, today kept at the Copenhagen Royal Library. Another one roughly 100 years younger, also Danish, and an Icelandic one from the end of the 15th century. I'm uh, looking more closely into these three to uh, give you one perspective to these collections of recipes. I just want to quote Timothy Tomasek um, in his article cookbooks in the Handbook of Medieval Studies. He subsumizes, as you can see, the earliest manuscript collections of recipes are often short, often lack a clear title or clear divisions and rubrics, and are often inserted within codices, having no other relevance to food and cuisine. Um, I just want to check how things are concerning our Danish and Icelandic manuscripts. Let's have a look. One to the left, the K is the oldest Danish. Um, the Q in the middle is uh, the younger Danish and the one to the right is the Icelandic. You could see here, it is rather the opposite concerning uh, the Danish um, oldest manuscript. And um, if we look at these um, manuscripts as a whole, you could say that the medieval north um, provides, um, provides a learned, um, um, uh, sorry for my English, uh, a learned um, way into the recipe literature, both in the way the manuscript is made and uh, as we will see also concerning the languages. The medieval north is not characterized by such a rich tradition of recipes um, as for example, the German speaking areas, um, these three manuscripts I show you are actually the only ones we know from medieval Scandinavia. Um, there is a fourth manuscript, which I also will uh, deal with very briefly, namely a middle low German one, kept in Wolfenbüttel. I said, we have these recipe collections from three different times, but actually it's more or less renderings, versions of one and the same original collection of recipes that have been transmitted uh, through medieval Scandinavia. Until very recently, um, the, oldest germ, the oldest Danish one was uh, thought of being one of the oldest, perhaps the oldest um, Volga recipe collections of the Middle Ages, but this was rejected, for example, by Bruno Lourieu. Um, and thus quoted in the edition of the recipes by Grew and Hyatt in 2001. Let's have a look at the individual manuscripts. And what I'm going to do is I want to look at the recipe collections um, from a manuscript context and a compilation perspective. So here, marked in red, we find the cookery book and the oldest Danish recipe collection. 
um, inserted in a codex that mainly con contains the works of Henrik Harpestrang. He was a Danish physician. We, don't, we do not know much about him. Um, he is the only Danish physician known abroad. He died on April the 2nd, 1244, as a canon in Roskilde. And it is clear that he must have studied abroad. It is assumed that he might have been to Salerno and uh, on a very unsafe basis, he is uh, identified or has been identified with a certain Magister Henricus Darkus, uh, from whom two works uh, survive in several 15th century manuscripts, Latin works, work on laxatives, de simplicibus medicinis laxativis, and an herbal, Liber Habarum. He has probably dwelt at Orléans and perhaps been the personal physician to King Eric IV of Denmark, also called Eric Plaupenny. Harperstring's other works, as we find in uh, the Codex NCOS 66 here, are written in Danish, or older Middle Danish to be more precise. This book of herbs is actually two books of herbs, uh, which are clearly separated um, by institutional explicits. Yeah, and uh, this cookbook, um, for some reason, has been regarded as a later edition, edition um, not belonging to um, the original Harpestrings works, which is interesting because we have the very oldest text witness here containing it, and as we'll see, um, written by one scribe, all put together very neatly uh, around 1300. The main text of K, as I said, is in Old Danish, but rubrics and uh, paratexts are in Latin, as is, um, and in addition, uh, it contains a numerous Middle Low German and other loanwords. It clearly shows multilingual features, usually associated with translation and transmissions. Um, you see the parts here, and looking at the time, I just speed up a bit. Um, the whole codex, as I said, was, I, was written and diligently written by one scribe uh, who spectacularly identifies himself here, namely as Brother Knut Juhl um, at the end of the first horrible. And uh, perhaps once more at the end of the cookbook, but there was an erasure. With a very diligent mise en page and um, um, writing, initials, titles, incipits, and explicits being in red, blue, and green, it is far more elaborately decorated, as Grewe and Hyatt point out, than most early cookery manuscripts. K contains, contains um, 25 recipes for walnut and almond oil, butter, milk and milk pie for several sauces to be served with different types of fish and meat, for mush and pasties, and for several chicken dishes. The title is given both in the incipit and the explicit and starts in the following way. Incipit libellus de arte corpinaria, cum modo fiat oleum de nucibus. Yes. The first thing you can see this um, at the um, upper right side. We have a look at the next one. The next manuscript um, is actually a very brief one. And this is due to the fact that um, the five folio it contains had been taken out of a larger codex, which now is uh, in Stockholm. Um, and it contains the code of Jutland um, and some editions. And uh, it can be seen that um, where this codex and the C41, uh, in the middle of a text that is a royal decree from 1251, uh, exactly there, the five leaves now in Copenhagen start, so it is clear that this layer has been taken out. And on these five pages, we get 31 recipe, recipes um, in NCOS 70R. Um, there is considerable overlap 
they share 21 recipes. Um, and if one looks at the texts, um, one immediately gets the idea that this, these are independent translations of two closely related sources, such as the first editor of the work has pointed out, Christensen in 1908. Um, there are significant differences. For example, this manuscript does not have the rubrics in Latin as the older Danish version. Um, we have to assume that the scribe made different choices and might even at times have copied the older or the, the common uh, urtext, as Grave and Hyatt call it, uh, more diligently than uh, the K text. We have another version, now not Danish, but Icelandic, from the end of the 15th century. And this is yeah, written in Icelandic, as it says. And um, it has also the harvesting herbal, the lapidary, and the cookbook, as Kay has. Um, one has to assume that there was a Norwegian intermediary, which is now lost. D, in contrast uh, to the younger Danish one, keeps the Latin titles and uh, also keeps some low German um, recipe titles, though um, often in a way that one has to assume that they were not really appropriately uh, um, understood. I give you one, um, one example here. Um, the Kameline source has been mentioned um, before in, in the uh, conference, and here we have it um, in the oldest version I show you. It doesn't have the title Kameline source. Here it is called a lordly source, that at Herreselse, um, as it said, and um, the Latin title calls it a, a Salsum Dominorum. Yeah, a lordly source. Um, the recipe is short. I read it to you. One takes cloves and nutmeg, cardamom, pepper, cinnamon, that is cannel, and ginger, all in equal amounts, except that there should be as much cannel as all the other spices, and add twice as much toasted bread as of everything else, and grind them all together, and blend with strong vinegar, and place it in a cask. This is a lordly sauce, and it is good for half a year. We have actually seen you acting this out. This was a pleasure to watch. Um, the next recipe tells us what to do with this sauce so that you could uh, dress and preserve meat uh, when you put it into the sauce. The problem with the otherwise um, uh, practical edition of uh, these three texts and the Low German one by Grieve and Hyatt from 2001, uh, which is, um, stupendously annotated, so there's uh, very good commentaries. There's just one problem uh, which directly affects um, our area here, namely when we are looking for small signs uh, how the recipes were perceived in a dietary context. Remarks that were reflecting possible dietetic um, or other uses of these recipes come last in the recipes. So the very last sentences are of interest. And here um, we see some mistranslations and misconceptions. I just give you one example here. Um, not, and this I say not because I, I want to, to criticize this edition. Uh, this is more, um, one has to be aware when one uses this um, otherwise very useful book um, when it comes to details. Here, um, in a recipe of a rather simple sauce, um, which is a salsa of minimal cost, um, the recipe runs as follows. One should take onions and chop them as small as peas and the same amount of parsley and pour in some broth and add a fourth part of vinegar. These sauces are for simple people, the text uh, reads in the translation. But it doesn't say that. Um, it says, Feste Salze, Sell Yemen, which uh, has to be translated as people sell this sauce or these sauces. And um, 
if we look at the parallel version in the younger Danish manuscript that is Q here, then it says, then Salse got wegfahrend men. This source is good for traveling people. But traveling people cannot just be understood like vagabonds, poor people. It can cover this, but it is a neutral term. It is people on their way, also meaning merchants. For example, um, Israeli merchants in a Danish Bible translation, an old Danish Bible translations, um, are called wegfahrend here. So for some reason, um, it is mentioned that this was a good source for these. Perhaps it keeps well. Um, so we could, um, which I cannot do here today because of time, uh, look at these very last sentences. And I will do a bit of that when wrapping up my lecture in a sec. Not before we have looked at an interesting um, version that could point back to an intermediary in Low German. It has been speculated on the basis of uh, the many Low German recipe names um, that the collection was transmitted um, via a Low German word text. I say um, we have to bear in mind that uh, the realm of Denmark was at least trilingual when it came to the uh, better educated, that is, apart from Danish, of course, Latin, but also Low German. Low law texts and other texts were um, often quite early translated into Low German. So uh, it could actually have originated also in um, the Danish realm, just to say that. Here we have a 15th uh, century Low German a manuscript that contains medical texts and a cookery book. Um, also other recipes and um, both in low and in high German. Um, you will find here it is 103 recipes in these codex, but now let's um, have a look at just part of uh, the incipits of the recipes. Uh, the editors of the three Scandinavian texts and this one pointed out uh, that here between recipe number 56 and 72 in the Low German Codex, the incipit changes. It had been very regularly in the first instances, just with very few exceptions, namely, will to marken, item, will to marken, if you want to make. Um, this changes here for some recipes, namely, now we get imperatives, um, like nim, you know, take, or uh, men shall nemen, men shall nemen, uh, one should take. And this is exactly the section where we have a, a, an overlap with the Scandinavian recipes and the low German ones. Thus, it very much looks like um, that here, this section resembles a collection that um, was the basis for all four manuscripts um, I mentioned in my talk today. I'm not going to dwell on this, but um, as the thing is recorded, and if you want to have a closer look, you can just uh, look this up again. Here it is shown um, how the text numbers and the individual collections look like. I'm not going into the text debate here. It is um, a practical thing that the editors just have numbered the recipe so it's easy to compare. And what is most striking is one feature. K, Q, and D have uh, pretty much the same order of recipes. That's very consistent. Uh, and W has not. There is a certain follow, uh, there is a certain order here, as you see in the right margin, but uh, there's also some rearrangement or um, another order of recipes. So here, there's clearly the biggest divide between the four manuscripts, three against one. I jump to my conclusions. And uh, um, Yes, I would like that, but I lost them here either. Um, 
I start with the recipes and the um, and we'll have a focus on the dietary embedding. First, concerning the recipes, the organization um, are by ingredients, which can be clearly seen um, in the almond section because there appears a pie. Otherwise, you could have thought, well, first we have some produce that is reused in some recipes as almond milk, uh, and then some sauces, and then some chicken dishes. But here uh, we clearly see, due to the almond pie, that the thought was ingredients. We have no direct reference to diet that is 100% clear. We have references to economics. That is, how long does a dish or a sauce keep? Which is also partly in the title. We have references to users, namely, this sauce is sold by people, or uh, this is good for traveling people. We have a certain uh, way of um, presenting amounts. These are relative amounts in parts. So like take one part of this and seven parts of that. The time is not given just by result. Stir until it thickens. Um, what we have though, and now we actually approaching the dietary context of this is uh, very few remarks on consumption, namely, this chicken is good to eat warm. Or, um, and again, we encounter a problem in the translation, um, this stirs the appetite, had been mistranslated, this is good to eat, but uh, one recipe has stirs the appetite, which is the same one um, between the two versions K and Q, namely um, recipe 22, if you want to look it up. Um, what we often have is a very unspecific, this is good. And good could mean preservation, it could be taste, it could be digestion, or it could also be health effects. And now my main point, and by this I conclude, is uh, that as you have seen in the uh, synopsis of the contents, in three cases, namely K, D, and W, that is the oldest Danish, the Icelandic, and the low German versions, we have a very clear uh, um, uh, context of uh, a me clear medical context that is a combination of the herbal and the lapidary and then the cookbook in the oldest Danish manuscript and the Icelandic, um, that is the information about digestion, about health effects is already given. For example, when it says about cinnamon, um, one of the standard sentences, uh, it makes uh, the food melt, melt in your stomach. Yeah? Um, then the information is already given in the manuscript context. So there was no literal need for this to be repeated in a recipe. It is clear for the user and um, this is also helped, uh, and we see user marks by rubrics in the margin or margins or commentaries in the margins. So um, I just put some literature in this presentation. So you see some of it and I leave it there and wait for questions. Thanks for me. Yes. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. But at the moment, I don't have a question for you. <laughs> That's all fine. <laughs> I can't start my video because uh, the host is not letting me do that. But in any case, um, I, I was fascinated by your uh, uncovering the, the cameline sauce even in, uh, in Iceland because, of course, yeah. the cameline sauce is a real uh, European standard. And uh, I find them all the time in Italy. They're well known in France, but who would have guessed that they got all the way to, uh, to Iceland. So I'm wondering whether there are other uh, examples of really European wide uh, recipes that you are finding in, in your sources. Yes. Um... 
actually they are. And uh, the chameleon sauce is a good example because you have the three very standard all European recipes there for sauces or dressings, if you want, wish. You have the chameleon, you have the green sauce, um, and you have mustard. Uh, all contained here and very much in line with what is to be found elsewhere. Um, so this is interesting also to me because we have such an early uh, vulgar example of this um, in, in Danish. And uh, just, uh, I, was I was a bit puzzled, why not the name? I mean, otherwise the connection is so uh, observant about the names, but Camelin has not been uh, rendered here. If we would look again at the recipe, we would find that it is quite aligned with what uh, the statutes of, um, I think it's late 14th century Paris says about uh, the chameleon sauce, where there is a prescription what it has to contain. So um, it is based on vinegar in our um, Danish cookbook here, not in, on wine. Um, and I think that's what in these statutes has to be found. So that's, it's a very international thing the recipe collection. Otherwise, sure, I could go on, but uh, the time will not be there um, yeah. or to, tra to trace what is internationally uh, accessible of the recipe collection. Yeah, but we have a question from Bruno Lorio. Mm -hmm. Just, just a, a suggestion for you. Uh, you hear me? Yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I was very interesting with your new new translation of the recipe uh, for the sauce is good for traveling people. It's yeah. very important because we have in in Latin uh, in the 14th century um, uh, a book a cookbook whose name is Modus Viaticorum Preparandorum Salsarum etc. So Viaticorum that means uh, food for travelers. Yeah. So maybe it, it was published in a, in an unpublished thesis uh, PhD. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the one of uh, Carol Lambert. Or maybe you can uh, you can have a, you can compare uh, to to see if there is a if there is a, a link. Because um, uh, I think your, your treatise is, uh, even if it's not from 12th century, as we thought uh, yeah. originally, uh, it's an old one, one of the oldest ones. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be compared with, uh, with the Durham manuscript uh, mm -hmm. and with also the, the, this, uh, this manuscript in, uh, in Latin mixed with Occitan. Mm -hmm. Yes. What you thanks thanks you so so much and I really would love to do this and I'm also very grateful for this uh, uh, for 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 your uh, remark concerning this um, travelers recipe mm -hmm. thing that is uh, that is great so um, as I initially said I'm just at the start of my journey here and uh, I also will make another go and not the first uh, to see what might be the closest collection of recipes. Um, um, the <laughs> Creo and Hyatt um, have have um, tried, and well, we, we have to see because I think the Korema project and your work is an excellent basis to uh, make another go and see uh, how far this gets us. So I'm uh, super interested in in um, pursuing this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ike. I'm afraid we have to keep moving because uh, we're running out of time. Uh, et donc, uh, maintenant, on passe au français parce que la prochaine uh, personne qui va parler, c'est Madeleine Ferrière qui nous va, va parler sur uh, une recette dans le platine en François. Uh, et um, les professeurs d'histoire moderne à l'Université d'Avignon étaient honoraire rattaché au labo de recherche Telem de Aix-en-Provence. Il a travaillé sur les sensibilités et les comportements alimentaires, euh, les peurs, et aujourd'hui sur la construction des cuisines régionales, et donc euh, d'un point de vue occitan. Euh, donc, Madeleine, je te passe la parole. Euh, 
Bonjour et, et merci de m'avoir invité malgré mon, mon incompétence en, en anglais. Donc, euh, diapo suivante, s'il vous plaît, Christophe. Je vais vous parler d'une euh, recette d'un livre que beaucoup connaissent, c'est le platine en français. On sait qu'à Lyon, en 1505, François Fradin fait paraître euh, ce livre dont le succès éditorial est bien connu, 21 ou 23 rééditions entre 1505 et 1588. Le platine en français s'avère un des best-sellers de la Renaissance française. Si platine lui-même, c'est-à-dire Bartholomeo Sacchi, est un personnage dont on connaît bien la vie et la carrière de polygraphe, en revanche, du traducteur de 1505, on ne sait rien, sinon ce qu'il dit lui-même au début du livre, diapo suivante. Euh, au début de son prologue, on le voit, il, il s'annonce, il s'appelle Didier Christol et il habite à Montpellier. Ma proximité géographique avec les archives montpelliéraines m'a incité à enquêter sur ce mystérieux Didier Christol. Les quelques traces que j'ai pu mettre à jour me semblent intéressantes pour éclairer les conditions de production de cet ouvrage. Et pour aller tout de suite à ma conclusion, il me semble que le contexte de production de cet ouvrage confirme parfaitement les liens entre médecine et alimentation que la lecture même de l'ouvrage laisse déjà entrevoir. Donc, euh, d'abord sur Didier Christo lui-même. Platine n'était ni médecin ni cuisinier. Christo n'est pas cuisinier, il est médecin et il est chanoine. Euh, voilà pourquoi d'ailleurs il a ce, cet avant-titre de messire. Il appartient à un chapitre de Montpellier et pas n'importe quel chapitre, le plus important, le chapitre cathédral. Il fait partie de ce petit cercle d'humanistes qui gravite autour de l'évêque Guillaume Pellissier. Il est médecin aussi et là, le cursus universitaire est beaucoup plus difficile à reconstituer dans la mesure où j'ai trouvé peu de sources continues à l'école de médecine, par exemple, le registre matricule de l'université n'est conservé qu'à partir de 1510. En revanche, c'est dans les archives de l'hôtel de ville que j'ai trouvé quelques indices précieux. La première mention que j'ai relevée sur lui, c'est dans les contes de la Claverie de 1477, où il est qualifié de magistère, c'est-à-dire de maître, et d'étudiant. On peut supposer donc qu'il est majeur et il serait donc né dans les années 1450. La seconde mention, c'est 20 ans après, si on peut passer à la diapo suivante, c'est un manifeste de 1497. Un manifeste, c'est-à-dire une déclaration de patrimoine, et on voit qu'au premier paragraphe, il déclare euh, premièrement un hôtel euh, en l'Aiguillerie, la rue de l'Aiguillerie, c'est la rue la plus huppée de Montpellier, et euh, j'ai pu deviner que le profil de Christol n'est pas du tout un profil à la Rabelais, euh, chanoine bien entendu, médecin tous les deux, mais Christol n'est pas du tout euh, un moine girovague, c'est quelqu'un de, de bien enraciné, de bien installé, dans la bourgeoisie et dans le patricien Montpellierin, et il a hérité cet hôtel de son père qui était un riche marchand Montpellierin. Alors, la note marginale est difficile à déchiffrer, mais elle est très intéressante parce que c'est là qu'on voit qu'il est mentionné comme étudiant et fréquentant les studies, et on sait qu'il doit approcher quand même les 50 ans, c'est assez, euh, assez étonnant de savoir qu'il a repris euh, les chemins de euh, l'université euh, 20 ans après. En même temps, cette note est là pour euh, euh, 
lui faire bénéficier du dégrèvement fiscal que la municipalité accorde à tous les, les étudiants ou les docteurs en médecine. Et puis, en dessous commence, euh, on voit second paragraphe, les autres biens de nouveau comprats, de nouveau euh, nouvellement achetés. Et on voit qu'effectivement, à partir de euh, cette année 1497, il commence à acheter euh, pas mal de, de biens fonciers, ce qui prouve un certain enrichissement dont nous allons parler dans un moment. Donc, on est en 1497 et ces années 1497-1498 sont vraiment des années très euh, importantes pour la mise en œuvre du platine en français. C'est là où il y a une conjonction euh, de deux événements majeurs. Le premier, c'est le moment où le roi Louis XII crée quatre régences à l'école de médecine, marquant ainsi un renouveau euh, dans l'enseignement de la médecine à Montpellier. Il est certain que ces régents, nouvellement nommés, rétribués par le roi, ont cœur à asseoir leur réputation et la réputation aussi de leur école. On sait que cette réputation, depuis le Moyen-Âge, repose essentiellement sur la diététique. Montpellier a dans ses gènes une vocation diététique qui la distingue dans le royaume de l'autre grande école médicale, c'est-à-dire Paris. Pour continuer à faire vivre cet héritage médiéval, une difficulté surgit, c'est qu'il n'y a pas d'imprimerie à Montpellier, il n'y en aura jamais. L'obstacle est contourné grâce à une solide connexion établie entre les maîtres montpelliérains et les éditeurs lyonnais. Dès 1500, le marché du livre médical montpelliérain est à Lyon, en particulier autour des frères Fradins. Diapositive suivante. L'un des frères, Constantin, est très actif à Montpellier, où il a la clientèle des médecins, des professeurs, mais aussi du clergé. François, son frère, dont on voit la, la marque, est imprimeur à Lyon et il a lancé une collection de livres médicaux puisés dans le fonds diététique montpelliérain et traduit par des montpelliérains. On voit ce que François Fradin a trouvé à Montpellier, c'est-à-dire une ville peuplée de maîtres et d'écoliers qui sont grands consommateurs de livres et qui, en plus, constituent un vivier d'érudits capables de, de prêter main forte à ses activités éditoriales en lui proposant des manuscrits, en les traduisant, en corrigeant euh, ses épreuves. Et ce qui est important, c'est que c'est dans cette collection euh, lancée par Fradin que le platine en français va paraître. Euh, on voit donc que ce n'est pas du tout une œuvre isolée, mais euh, platine en français s'inscrit dans une stratégie éditoriale. D'ailleurs, si on le compare à la traduction euh, en français euh, du régime euh, de santé d'Arnaud de Villeneuve, qui est publié toujours à Lyon par ce même euh, Fradin qui a été publié quatre ans avant, on voit que les choix éditoriaux sont déjà arrêtés à ce moment-là et que les conventions se répètent d'un livre à l'autre. Dans ce contexte, il me semble que la traduction du platine est apparue sans doute au Montpelliérain comme un enjeu fondamental pour pouvoir asseoir cette tradition diététique et en même temps pour renouveler les connaissances. Fondamental pour deux raisons. La première, on le sait, c'est que le platine a des prétentions encyclopédiques. C'est un véritable dictionnaire des aliments et c'était l'occasion de récapituler toute la matière euh, euh, diététique. La seconde raison, euh, diapo suivante, s'il vous plaît, si on voit ce, ce, ce sous-titre bien connu, qui traite de honnête volupté, ça on peut dire que c'est un sous-titre qui convient parfaitement aux Montpelliérains, qui convient parfaitement à leur enseignement, parce qu'ils n'ont pas cessé d'enseigner une morale diététique assez aimable, qui conjugue sans aucun conflit d'un côté le plaisir, en particulier le plaisir de manger, et puis de l'autre la, la santé, et les Montpelliérains ont été toujours soucieux de délivrer des, des préceptes assez souples pour être euh, euh, obéis. 
c'est dans la tradition de la médecine pratique de Montpellier que d'avoir ce souci de, de l'observance de l'adhésion, comme on dirait aujourd'hui, euh, du, euh, du patient. Et on sait qu'en retour, c'est ce, ce, ce souci qui a euh, nourri les critiques de leurs confrères parisiens qui n'avaient pas assez de mots pour euh, taxer leurs collègues montpelliérains de, de laxisme, de suivisme et de conformisme. L'autre événement, si euh, on peut bien passer à la diapo suivante, c'est beaucoup plus personnel, mais c'est selon moi étroitement coléré, corrélé à cette conjoncture médicale que je viens d'exposer, c'est qu'en 1498, Didier Christol obtient le bénéfice du prieuré euh, de Saint-Maurice. Alors Saint-Maurice, Saint-Maurice de Sauré, près de Montpellier à l'époque de Christol, maintenant dans l'agglomération même de Montpellier. Il y a d'ailleurs toujours un moulin à Sauré, au bord du Lèze, qui est toujours en activité. Ce prieuré n'est pas un petit bénéfice. C'est le plus ancien établissement monastique de la ville, idéalement situé sur un riche terroir, au bord du Lèze, la rivière que l'on voit ici, et qui assura longtemps la liaison entre Montpellier et la Méditerranée. Dans ce prieuré, il y a différents revenus, et en particulier douze carterets de prairies inondées. C'est ce genre de terrain que, on le sait depuis les travaux de Leroy Ladurie sur les compois de Montpellier, ce genre de terrain inondable que la bourgeoisie montpelliéraine s'arrache et que Christol donc, va pouvoir arrenter à très bon prix. Être prieur de Saint-Maurice, c'est disposer d'un prestige, de revenus très confortables et en contrepartie de charges pastorales très légères. De quoi vous inciter à reprendre les chemins de l'université et à travailler sous la férule de ces régents. De 1498 à 1506, le retitulaire de ce bénéfice, c'est Didier Christol. Euh, huit ans, il faut six ans ou un peu plus pour euh, euh, achever un, un doctorat en médecine, présenter une thèse. Il a fallu sans doute aussi ce temps pour traduire, commenter et publier le platine. Si bien que ce bénéfice ecclésiastique, pour moi, a toutes les caractéristiques d'une bourse de recherche universitaire. Diapo suivante, s'il vous plaît. Euh, je n'ai pas réussi à bien cadrer, excusez-moi, mais c'est à, à la fin du livre où, en nous indiquant euh, qu'il est titulaire euh, de Saint-Maurice, prieur de Saint-Maurice, en nous indiquant qu'il a travaillé avec d'autres euh, docteurs de l'Université euh, de Montpellier, des médecins qu'on peut, me semble-t-il, rapprocher de ces nouveaux recteurs en poste à Montpellier, je pense que Christol nous a dit finalement l'essentiel sur les conditions d'élaboration de platine placées sous le double patronage de l'école de médecine et de l'évêque. Euh, pour moi, ce livre est issu d'un d'un projet qui est piloté à la fois par l'université et par l'évêché, qui sont loin d'être deux entités, euh, euh, comment dire, euh, antithétiques, mais au contraire fortement interconnectées à Montpellier, à la fois socialement et institutionnellement. Donc, un livre médical avant tout. Christol nous dit qu'il a copieusement augmenté la version originale, et c'est vrai. Le livre 2505, sa traduction, contient près de 800 000 signes quand l'original latin n'atteint pas les 300 000. Cette augmentation est d'autant plus remarquable qu'elle concerne principalement la première partie du livre, c'est-à-dire la partie euh, franchement euh, diététique sous forme d'addition, de commentaires ou même de nouvelles rubriques. C'est donc, il a procédé à toute une mise à jour de la matière diététique telle qu'elle était enseignée à ce moment-là à Montpellier. 
En revanche, dans la dernière partie, celle qui est la plus connue, la partie culinaire, il est très peu intervenu. Euh, L'intérêt secondaire qu'il semble porter aux recettes est tout à fait compréhensible. Tout l'équilibre du livre, d'ailleurs, euh, reflète les représentations médicales de l'époque, quand les médecins montpelliérains disent et répètent « la cuisine est la servante de la médecine ». Et par ailleurs, pourquoi retoucher les recettes du platine original Ce sont des recettes d'origine italienne, mais aussi catalane, et c'est un syncrétisme culinaire qui convient tout à fait euh, au Languedoc euh, littoral euh, où se situe Montpellier, qui a toujours été à la jonction entre les influences italiennes et les influences catalanes. Donc, deux nouvelles recettes seulement, l'une courte, qu'il appelle une sauce muscade, et l'autre beaucoup plus longue, diapo suivante, qui s'appelle euh, « Pour cuire un chapon ou un cuisseau, c'est-à-dire un gigot, euh, à l'étouffer ». Alors, pourquoi ces deux ajouts Je voudrais savoir le sens de l'intervention de Christol, qui fait qu'à ce moment-là, il passe du statut de simple traducteur ou simple commentateur un statut d'auteur. Alors, je me suis dit dans un premier temps que peut-être ces recettes avaient une valeur diététique particulière. Mais je pense qu'il faut renoncer à cette hypothèse. Toutes les recettes dans le platine sont assorties d'un commentaire diététique. Ici, le commentaire est très euh, euh, favorable, mais c'est ce qui arrive aussi dans beaucoup d'autres recettes. Euh, la seule chose qu'on peut noter, un peu subtile, si vous voulez, l'avis qu'il donne à la fin de cette recette de Chapon, c'est la façon dont il ordonne ses jugements. Il nous dit, à la fin, c'est une viande fort délicieuse, donc d'abord l'avis d'un gastronome, proto-gastronome, une viande fort délicieuse, saine et bonne pour la santé, c'est-à-dire qu'il fait passer la santé après le le jugement hédoniste. Euh, je pense donc que ce n'est pas l'hypothèse diététique qui est la bonne. Euh, Peut-être euh, invoquer un souci qu'il a tout le temps de réactualisation. C'est le cas, par exemple, pour euh, la sauce muscade qui apparaît comme une euh, nouvelle version de cette euh, cameline dont vous venez de dire, Alain et l'orateur précédent, à quel point elle était répandue euh, dans tout, euh, tout l'espace euh, européen. Euh, la cameline, euh, la sauce muscade de Cristol, met en valeur la noix muscade et la graine de paradis, c'est-à-dire euh, deux épices à la mode, une once de cannelle et onze de sucre, c'est-à-dire des doses tout à fait significatives de cette invasion sucrière de la cuisine méridionale à la fin du Moyen-Âge, mise en évidence par Bruno Loriot. Ce n'est pas une sauce acide que l'on aurait édulcorée, mais à l'inverse une sauce douce à laquelle on ajoute, in fine, un peu de vinaigre pour donner goût et pointe. Donc, c'est une version nouvelle d'une recette ultra classique du répertoire occidental. Ce qu'on ne peut absolument pas dire de cette recette euh, que je vous présente. Ce qui frappe d'emblée en complète rupture avec les recettes euh, originales de Saki, c'est la longueur de la formule, le soin de son développement et le souci des doses. On a l'impression de voir là Christol, médecin, qui dicte sa recette comme on rédigerait une ordonnance. D'ailleurs, je crois que c'est le même mot à cette époque qu'on emploie. Mais plus que la modernité dans la forme, c'est la modernité du contenu lui-même qui m'interroge. Ce chapon ou mouton, cuisseau de, de mouton, à l'étouffer, c'est en fait ce qu'on a appellerait aujourd'hui un tajin, un tajin très sucré lui aussi, avec des raisins de corinthe, des dates, des prunes sèches. Un tajin qui aurait été très décontextualisé et recontextualisé, puisque c'est un ragoût qui baigne dans le vin, le vinaigre, le jus de lard et le bouillon gras, et non seulement il est épicé, très sucré, mais il est aromatisé avec les senteurs de la garrigue, puisqu'il y a du laurier, de la marjolaine, du serpolet. 
C'est donc un tajin qui aurait pris ses distances par, la version, euh, par rapport à la version originale jusque dans ses fonds de cuisson, puisqu'il transgresse deux interdits fondamentaux de l'islam, c'est-à-dire le lard et le vin. Je me demande euh, si c'est un plat venu d'ailleurs qui a perdu son identité, ou bien si c'est un plat indigène dont le mode de préparation est tout à fait semblable à un tajin. Donc voilà l'alternative dans laquelle je me trouve. Soit un plat indigène, disons sans doute mieux, un plat issu d'un fond commun pré-islamique. Euh, je sais qu'il ne faut pas se laisser prendre au jeu d'étymologie, mais les linguistes nous apprennent que le mot berbère de tajin a son équivalent euh, en grec classique euh, et dans beaucoup de langues latines, par exemple, c'est en Corse le tijanou, en Sicile le tiganou, et en Occitan, euh, nous avons le tian. Et le tian ressemble tout à fait au tajin en ce que ça désigne à la fois le récipient, le plat creux, son couvercle, et puis le contenu qu'il y a à l'intérieur. Ce rapprochement paraît d'autant plus légitime que le matériel et la technique de cuisson euh, entrent tout à fait dans la pratique culinaire languedocienne de cette époque, me semble-t-il. D'abord, la cuisson à l'étouffée, qui semble exceptionnelle dans la cuisine du Nord, l'est beaucoup moins dans la cuisine méridionale. Et puis, euh, dernière diapo, s'il vous plaît, les archéologues ont pu répertorier à Montpellier à la fin du Moyen-Âge 55 formes de vaisselle régionale en terre pour la cuisson. Et parmi elles, on peut tout à fait repérer des récipients, des récipients de type euh, euh, diable en argile cuite avec des formes tronconiques qui rappellent euh, tout à fait les plats à tajin que nous connaissons. Seulement voilà, les archéologues de Montpellier nous disent aussi que les échanges ont été constants entre les potiers de Montpellier et les faïenciers andalous, et que les potiers de Montpellier ont emprunté beaucoup de leurs modèles à leurs collègues de Valence, si bien que le contenant pose exactement le même problème que le contenu. Est-ce que c'est une production locale ou est-ce que c'est un transfert culturel Donc, cette seconde hypothèse, c'est que Christol donnerait une version occitane d'un plat emprunté au fond culinaire arabo-musulman. L'hypothèse de transfert culturel est d'autant plus possible qu'on est à Montpellier et qu'on sait que l'école de médecine de Montpellier n'a pas cessé d'entretenir tout au long du Moyen-Âge des relations scientifiques et Montpellier elle-même, la ville des relations commerciales et culturelles très forte et continue avec le monde ibérique. L'école de médecine en particulier s'est enrichie de tout l'apport de médecine arabe et en 1505, euh, au moment où Christol fréquente pour la dernière année sans doute les, les bancs de l'université, c'est encore Avicenne qui est l'auteur le plus euh, étudié dans le programme euh, délivré aux étudiants en médecine et, et je crois bien que c'est Avicenne qui cite le plus souvent, d'ailleurs, euh, dans sa, sa version du, du platine. Alors, on sait que 1505, le contact avec le monde andalou n'existe plus, mais il est tout de même prolongé par la présence très forte à Montpellier de la minorité marane. Faut-il alors envisager cette recette comme un, un apport récent de la communauté marane qui a fui l'Espagne et qui est venu s'installer à Montpellier. Un médecin comme Jean Falcon, qui est un de régions qui a sans doute supervisé l'élaboration de ce livre, fait partie de cette communauté et je le verrai bien comme le dernier maillon des interférences culinaires de longue durée entre Montpellier et le monde andalou. Cependant, j'ai beaucoup parlé au conditionnel parce que… Euh, rien ne me permet de trancher entre euh, ces deux hypothèses. Et ce qui serait intéressant de savoir, et que je ne connais pas du tout, c'est la, la généalogie de l'introduction euh, dans la littérature culinaire euh, occidentale des recettes de tajine. Si bien que ma conclusion sera en forme de question. 
une question d'une moderniste qui s'adresse à des, des médiévistes bons connaisseurs euh, du patrimoine culinaire occidental. Est-ce qu'on trouve, avant 1505, avant la publication de ce livre, une quelconque mention d'un tajin, d'un plat qui lui approche dans euh, le répertoire culinaire occidental Est-ce qu'on a, avant Christol, la trace d'une transmission textuelle d'un tajin voilà ma conclusion euh, ouverte et voilà les quelques données que j'ai pu rassembler pour l'instant sur Christol. Un énorme merci pour cette très, très intéressante conférence. Plusieurs personnes ont réagi au niveau des panélistes dans la discussion pour juste vous remercier pour l'intérêt de cette conférence. Actuellement, je n'ai pas de questions. On va peut-être voir si Bruno Loriou ou Aline Greco voudraient réagir. Mais voilà, Bruno, c'est à toi. Je n'ai pas, pas de réponse à la question de, de Madeleine, hein, la question conclusive de cette belle, de cette belle démonstration. Euh, bon, moi, je suis toujours assez méfiant hein, sur les transferts euh, qui peuvent être simplement des transferts de de titres plus que de textes. Alors par, par contre, il peut y avoir des transferts techniques, bien entendu. Là, il faudrait faire une analyse peut-être plus, plus vaste, éventuellement aller voir de l'autre côté des Pyrénées, bien entendu, hein, de voir s'il n'y a pas des, euh, des, euh, comment dire, des relais hein, qui ont été pris. Peut-être, je ne sais pas, est-ce que tu as regardé le modus C'est toujours, je revends toujours le même, le même traité, c'est-à-dire ce traité... Euh, Occitan latin de la fin du XIVe siècle, qui a beaucoup destiné aux voyageurs, c'est ça. Voilà. Alors entre autres, hein, entre autres. Mm. Et donc c'est quand même du point de vue géographique le plus proche de tes affaires, même si du point de vue chronologique c'est pas le cas, hein, bien sûr. Hein. Donc, donc peut-être. Euh, bon, moi j'ai le texte, je peux te le passer, hein, mais il me semblait te l'avoir passé, je ne suis pas sûr. Et donc je, je, je te le ferai. Je te le ferai envoyer et tu, tu regarderas s'il y a des choses qui ressemblent, qui ressemblent à ça. Et puis nous, bah, du côté de, du côté de, de, comment dire, de Corema, eh bien, euh, on va essayer de trouver. Hein. Donc à travers notre, ah, outil, voilà. euh, notre outil, notre rubrique euh, Prescriptions, hein, euh, qui décrit au fond, qui, qui sont les verbes qui décrivent la manière de, de cuire. Hein. Euh, peut-être on peut trouver des choses hein. et puis tools aussi, c'est-à-dire le récipient voilà. dans la cuisine italienne aussi il doit y avoir des points, des points communs à mon avis, donc c'est pas perdu on n'a pas de réponse immédiate mais c'est pas perdu oui, merci merci, c'est pas un transfert de titre hein. tu as vu qu'il l'appelle oui, oui, oui. euh, gigot ou, ou, ou chapon voilà. ça peut être qu'un transfert de technique éventuellement c'est certain J'ai un commentaire de Béatrice Régnaud qui vous remercie tout d'abord pour cette très intéressante analyse de platine et qui suggérait de voir avec Marie-Joseph Moncorgé qui a justement étudié la cuisine méditerranéenne si elle ne pourrait pas vous apporter le niveau de précision. Il y a beaucoup de spécialistes hein, sur ces questions. Des vrais Bon. Mm -hmm. Pour ma part, je n'ai plus aucun commentaire ni question. Alain, il est... Well, <coughs> OK. Um, in, in ma... Merci, Madeleine. C'était très intéressant. Je cherchais dans ma tête des, des exemples en italien, mais ça ne me venait pas du tout. Mais bon, <rire> quand on cherche, on trouve. Ce n'est pas l'inverse. Donc, um, so um, I I'm, guess I'm going to be concluding because we're already 10 minutes over our allotted time. Uh, and I will say that uh, all of the proceedings of this morning will be available as of tomorrow. So you can watch them over again. Um, et donc, je le dis aussi en français. 
Euh, à partir de demain, vous pouvez revoir toute cette session de ce matin. Et hum, il ne me reste que de dire euh, bonne journée à tout le monde et bon travail. Goodbye.